Hi, my name is Rob Faro, and today we're going to talk about diagnosing pyloric stenosis with bedside ultrasound. Now, before we get too far into the topic, let's take a second and think about the typical patient. They will likely range anywhere from two weeks to eight months of age. Although overwhelmingly, most cases of pyloric stenosis occur between three weeks and six weeks of age. Additionally, from the history, the parents may report frequent episodes of vomiting, potentially projectile vomiting, and on examination, you may feel an olive-like mass which would be concerning for a hypertrophied pylorus. For probe selection, we're going to be using a high-frequency linear probe. Now let's change gears for a second and think about anatomy. We're going to be focusing our evaluation on the stomach as it enters into the intestines at the muscular junction called the pylorus. Now that we have a basic understanding of our anatomy, we can translate this over to our sonographic anatomy to help us better understand our orientation and landmarks. In this image, in the top left we have the liver, and on the right of the image, the antrum that extends into the stomach, with the pylorus in the center. Keep in mind that the pylorus typically will sit medial and posterior to the liver and or the gallbladder. So now that we've identified the pylorus on ultrasound, let's take a second and understand the anatomic layers of the pylorus on ultrasound to ensure we're getting the correct measurements. The first layer is the serosa. It's hyperchoic and on the outside of the pylorus. This is then followed by the muscularis externa, and this is the portion of the pylorus that actually hypertrophies when you have pyloric stenosis. This is the most important measurement you make for the diagnosis, so it's important to make sure you're not including the serosa or the underlying submucosa, which is shown here, when you make that measurement. Below the submucosa, you have the muscularis mucosa, which is typically hypoechoic, followed by a more hyperechoic mucosal layer. The final structure is the lumen of the pylorus or the canal. Typically, it's an open patent structure that has peristalsis going through, However, in a patient such as this that has pyloric stenosis, the canal is obliterated, but this is the position of the canal to make the measurement. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. Now let's talk about technique. Usually the patient will be lying supine. Hopefully they'll be calm, but you may need to take some measures to make sure that they're comfortable so that you can get a good evaluation. Now we'll talk about this later, but you may want to have a few towels on hand to help you appropriately position the patient. And here's an active scan of pyloric stenosis. The first thing you should note is that we're using the caudal tip of the liver as an ultrasound window. So not only is the liver an important anatomic landmark to identify the pylorus, but we can also use it to improve our ultrasound window. On the right side of the screen, we see the antrum of the stomach leading into the pylorus. There is some retrograde flow, but no forward flow. Now that we have our scan, we need to think about diagnostic criteria and make our measurements, as seen here. Now that's several measurements, and it may be difficult to remember this, as we don't do this scan every day. So an easy way to keep these numbers in mind is to think of pi. Pi is equal to 3.1416, and we basically have rounded up here. But the convenience of this is, we can remember that pyloric muscle diameter is 3, the pyloric transverse diameter is 14, and our pyloric lumen length is 16. By keeping pi in mind, you can remember your abnormal values when you're evaluating for pyloric stenosis. The first thing you'll likely want to measure is the muscularis externa. This is the most accurate and most reproducible measurement that you'll be using when you diagnose pyloric stenosis. You can measure this in the long and in the transverse axis. Now we have to remember our sonographic anatomy and make sure that we're not including the serosa or the muscularis mucosa or the submucosa in our measurement. We are focusing solely on the thickness of the muscularis externa, which is shown here. Now when you look at the transverse diameter, keep in mind we're looking at the entire diameter of the pylorus. So although this image initially just shows the measurement of the muscularis externa, this blue dotted line shows you the measurement that you would be taking if you were looking at the transverse diameter. The final measurement is the canal length. This will be taken in a long axis view, and again showed by the dotted line. An abnormal canal length is anything over 15 to 17 millimeters, and we can remember this range by keeping in mind 16 millimeters and our mnemonic of pi. Now here are a few tips and tricks that will help you be more successful when you look to diagnose pyloric stenosis in your emergency department. First, use warm room temperature gel. 
Additionally, you may want to consider using a right posterior oblique position. We'll achieve this position by putting our rolled up towels under the patient's left side. The advantage of this position is that it pushes the fluid towards the antrum and puts the gas that's in the stomach up towards the fundus. This improves your ultrasound window and makes it easier to identify the pylorus. And this is shown here. Finally, consider using water rather than milk if you need to add a little volume to improve your ultrasound window. Milk tends to have more gas and will actually make it more difficult to be able to see the antrum of the stomach and the pylorus. So if you do have to give a little volume, you may want to consider a small amount of water. Finally, if you do have to feed the patient, try to wait at least 15 minutes after feeding to scan to try and avoid pyloric spasm and an inaccurate measurement. Hopefully you now feel comfortable with scanning for pyloric stenosis and want to make it part of your clinical practice. You can find other point of care applications and five minute tutorials on our website, coralultrasound.com, and follow us at, at coralultrasound on Twitter for further updates. As always, if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you at ultrasoundpodcast at gmail.com.